Lepo pozdravljeni. Danes je z nami Chase Jonesi, dolgoletni predsalec Trocadero baleta in ustanovitelj in umetniški vodja barcelonskega baleta. Hello Chase, I warmly welcome you on our talk. And Tatiana, the word is yours. Good evening, Chase. Hi. Uh, how is Barcelona? Beautiful. Barcelona is always beautiful. I love it here. Is it spring already? Yeah, because um, things are starting to grow back, a little rainy. I think that's spring here. <laughs> Good. I hope we, we share the same atmosphere soon here because here it's still cold, so it's a kind of winter. Yeah, but uh, really welcome to this talk show. We are so happy we finally managed to meet the times and to have this discussion about, about you, about your work, about your life, about your thoughts of today. Uh, as our audience already knows, we do make it kind of unusual. So it's, it's very friendly and very up to the moment and up to each artist we invite uh, for the discussion. So uh, Chase, you are coming from United States, from Florida, yes. East Coast. I'm yeah. in a very, very small town in Florida. Okay. One uh, interesting thing was um, while I was reading your uh, biography, you started to meet ballet actually quite late. You were 14 years old when you started to go to school for ballet, of course. <laughs> yeah, well, I had started clogging, which is sort of like tap dancing when I was, <laughs> um, when I was younger. So then um, that already gave me a sense of coordination and rhythm, but um, my, I, and I always wanted to do ballet, but my father never allowed me. And then once uh, my mother and father separated, then I, I made it to the ballet studio. And um, my first ballet teacher was, you know, this extremely strict uh, Russian guy. And he trained me um, very athletic. It was a very athletic way to do it. He was a principal with the Perm State Ballet in Russia. And um, it was just really intense. And, I, and I'm really glad that I started that way um, because it really got me into that athletic shape really fast, so. But what was the idea? You said you were coming from a small town. Did you, did you how did you meet the ballet first time? Um, well, I also have a very demanding mother. <laughs> She's still very demanding. So um, she always wanted me to be an artist. So then, um, so I was doing tap dancing. I was doing acting in the theater. I also played the violin. Um, I actually was really good at playing the violin. And so I, um, when I was going into school, I auditioned and I got into a conservatory for the violin. So I was playing the violin and in the same building, there were the dancers right across the hall. And I would always run over there and go look. And then they didn't have any boys. So then they asked me, well, do you want to transfer to the dance department? Because we need um, boys. So that's what I did. I don't know. I. I, I liked playing the violin, but I love dancing. And I think that, you know, I just couldn't really fight it. That's good, huh? <laughs> you are not sorry for doing that. That's great. So uh, after that, after you finished school, you moved to Europe. How was it? Um, well, let's see, I spent a year in that conservatory in, in Florida. And then I went to boarding school in Virginia um, for another year and a half. 
And then after that, I joined Ballet Trocadero, which is based in New York City. So at 17 years old, I got into that company and I was the youngest person still ever to join that company. And um, then I started touring the world at, you know, 17 years old as a professional dancer, you know, super young. Um, so when you came, for instance, to a big company, like when you went to English National, then th this was the change of continent, of environment, of your, your work, right? Well, I mean, it was, not only was it changing where I was, you know, I was also making history. So I was dancing female roles. I, you know, I was doing that in Trocadero for 14 years, but then when I went to the English National Ballet and I auditioned and I got in to dance female roles, um, nothing like that had ever happened. So um, I don't think I really enjoyed London the entire time because I was so um, focused on what I was doing because I knew I needed to do it well. And I also, um, the technical level at the English National Ballet was a lot higher so I really needed to push myself and I, and I learned a lot while I was there. So we are here at this point of your life, uh, oh, <laughs> moving, <laughs> you know, building new milestones in, in ballet, uh, ballet history as well, uh, which is so um, important. And our, our, our talk show or you know, discussions we have with, with dancers and ballet artists around the world is always about thinking and rethinking ballet. So um, I have two, two, two questions now. One is about this. How did you, like an artist, think and rethink the ballet all over by doing dancing female roles? Uh, and the second one was, is uh, about the women heroes. I think both of those things like connect, uh, especially you were saying your mother, such a strong uh, figure. And I've read in your uh, interviews, you mentioned this. Uh, so how can you comment on both of those questions? Um. I think that uh, it's hard for me to, to see myself as changing the ballet world because I just simply happen to be talented in this way. So when I dance on my point shoes and I dance on my toes, um, that is when I dance my best. I have a natural talent for that. Um, my talent is not looking like a beautiful woman, it's dancing with those shoes. Um, and I, we, and dancing those steps and with my body type and with my talent, that's where I excel. Um, and so my fight was that there was no place for someone like me, even though I am talented in a really unique way. I'm not the most talented, but I'm uniquely talented. So then, um, I had to break down a lot of barriers and I had to change a lot of different, a lot of minds to, to prove that um, I had a place in classical ballet. Um, you know, in the opera world, this type of thing already exists where a lot of the men, they're called counter tenors, they sing in the female register. And they, even hundreds of years ago, like Vivaldi made all of these songs for these guys that had beautiful high range of voice, right? That's basically the same thing that I do. It looks a little bit different, but I think that I do it well. And so, but it's almost like I, I saw this on a, this phrase on a documentary this weekend. It's like, you know, when, when a giant looks in a mirror, they see nothing. So when I, when I'm looking in the mirror, I'm not thinking, oh my gosh, I'm making history. Oh my gosh, I'm different. Oh, I just see myself and that's just who I am. I don't see myself as in that way. I just love what I do, you know? But then um, part of me 
in the first place, wanting to discover these point shoes and, and, and these roles of female um, does stem from my mother figure. Um, my mom had to be my mom and my dad. You know, that's the sort of upbringing that I had. And that's why, maybe that's why my mom um, is so strong and why she pushed me and accepted me at the same time. And so I grew up with the strong figure in my life being my mother. Um, my mom was invincible. Maybe a lot of people think that about their dad. I just didn't have that dad, you know? So then when I got to the ballet studio and it was all women, um, that's what I associated with strength and beauty. And um, it intrigued me a lot more than the sports because I just, I didn't have that model. And so then I'm surrounded by all these girls that are killing themselves training in ballet and they look so beautiful and so light and elegant. And that's really what I wanted to aspire to look like. Um, that to me was challenging. That to me was beautiful. Um, but it just so happens we live in a male world. So then the fact that I'm so inspired by women, it, it's almost like um, society looks at me um, as if I'm downgrading myself. It seems like, oh, what a shame that I am embracing feminine things about myself or I love feminine parts of myself. Whereas if a woman tries to embrace male things, then, it, then she's applauded for it. You know what I mean? So if you see a woman uh, trying to, you know, make herself more masculine or be more like a, a man, whatever, you know, that is far more accepted than a man who is trying to embrace the feminine side. And I think that that's where the issue was. And it goes, for example, Natalia Osipova, she's one of the biggest ballerinas right now. She jumps higher than almost any man I've ever seen. And they love her for it, right? Because she's jumping like a man. But then why am I not applauded? Because I can dance like a woman. You know, isn't that just the same talent? So then there is this whole misogynistic thing about the ballet world and, and the world in general, where because I emulate women or I'm a more feminine person, it's not seen as something special. It's seen as strange or weak, you know. Um, maybe this is why I used, um, which, you prob probably don't agree right now, but let's see. I, I believe it's, it is changing the history, it's changing the attitude towards something and changing the understanding of beauty. This is really so nice how you explained uh, your starting point and I, I can see how you connected this from, from, from your youth. <laughs> it's all, all the time with you, so why don't just believe it is it like it's like this and embrace the beauty <laughs> this what i would would say you know uh but really women heroes who's the where where is this power what is it is it just the beauty or you find also something else because skills cannot you know only skills in ballet without art without beauty without feeling without emotion without you know your input as a person as an artist means nothing so what what is that you have what is that you see what is you, you want to discover what drives you well i mean a lot of the qualities of, of all of the women that i idolize and you know there's my mother of course but there's people like hillary clinton anna wintour from vogue um there's so many, you know, Michelle Obama, all of these people, all of these female leaders. When I was at the English National Ballet, the person that gave me that opportunity was Tamara Rojo. A female director gave me that opportunity. 
And the thing about, I find with women leaders and what, what I try to be like those types of leaders is yes, they make strong decisions, but they never lose their heart. There's heart in those decisions. There's logic in those decisions. It's not about ego. It's about doing the right thing for everybody and being fair. And, and my mom was like that too, especially when it came to fighting for me. Um, she wanted justice and she wanted fairness and she wanted me to have the freedom to just be who, who I am. And I think that Tamara Rojo, the director of English National Ballet, she fought for me in the very same way. So then as a, as a leader now and as a director, um, instead of being the star of my own company, I have to be a part of the solution. And so part of that is seeing people individually, understanding that these are humans that I'm dealing with. Um, being fair, uh, looking at people uh, and trying to bring out the best in them and giving opportunities to people that might be different but not seeing that as a bad thing. And instead really trying to, to showcase how they are special. Yes, we, we meet this in arts on all kinds of level. Uh, you know, with uh, with artists like you having, uh, you know, always facing uh, the other side, uh, not being accepted, and this we all somehow understand also as an art artist in general. Sometimes society does not um, accept us, but um, I think I think one of the most interesting things in your career is like really being brave and starting something on your own. So, uh, okay, the history we have, it's important. We grow with the history and we become stronger. Uh, we see what we want to do, we choose our way. But when an artist decides to, to make, to, you know, to bring alive his or her own, company this is like a huge decision how this happened well um actually the making history was the worst thing that ever happened to my career because um overnight i became extremely extremely famous in the ballet world everybody all of a sudden knew who i was um i was on the cover of the new york times i was on all of these news segments. Um, I was in Dance Magazine. I was doing, I, I just became extremely famous for doing that. And then um, none of the choreographers at the English National Ballet wanted me in their productions going further. So I could not continue there. And I could not find a job anywhere else because I was so famous and nobody wanted my type of publicity because they weren't sure how their audiences were going to react or their board of directors or whatever. So, so then the only offers I had was for television shows and movies. And I was like, but I want to dance. Like I want to be in a dance company. I don't, I just want to get on stage and be in rehearsal. I don't want to be on television. I don't want to be in movies and I don't want to make music and I don't want to do I don't want to be a celebrity. I just want to be a dancer. So then, um, let's see, I finished at the English National Ballet in June. And then I stopped because I couldn't find any work. And I was working at Disney, sewing, designing, and making costumes. All the costumes you see at Disney, all the furry characters, all the princess dresses, I had given up because literally there was no place for me. I had been pushed out. Um, and then my husband is from Barcelona. So then I wasn't happy doing that. So I did that for three months and then I came here. And then I met a group of dancers here that um, they were all very different. And so they didn't really have jobs. A really short Japanese guy, um, a really tall 
girl with boobs. Um, one girl had this, one boy had that. And, I, and all of a sudden it was like looking in a mirror and I'm like, oh my God, like these people are just like me. Like they, they have the same doubts and insecurities that, that I do. So I was like, that's when I realized that it was no longer about me. I think making history was the last thing that should be about me. And now it was time that, that I prevent anybody from ever feeling the way that I did. You know, I wanted to make sure that nobody is gonna come in to this company and I'm not gonna tell them they're fat. I'm not gonna tell them they're too short. I'm not gonna tell them to um, torture themselves and break their bodies for this I ideal situation. All they need to do at Ballet de Barcelona is dance and have ability and just dance. And so we created the company um, when I came here and we put the show together in like a month, we premiered and that's how we got our start with just like 12 or 13 dancers. Yeah, and now this happened in 2019. Mm -hmm. Just, just uh, I didn't want to go back to COVID, <laughs> but somehow we cannot, uh, we cannot jump over yet because there's been so many interesting things going around, uh, you know, people making different, different approaches, trying to save their work and their lives and give strength to their colleagues um, and to the community they work with. But one, one thing is like, um, Barcelona always sounds like a very interesting place to be. So you're talking about people you've met and you're invited to be a part of your company. It's like bringing together a small community of people. And how, how is it about then when COVID uh, started and it, you, it was hard for everybody, but how, how did this newly started work of yours fit in the community facing these harsh times? Um, it was really hard because we started that May of 2019. So we had our premiere and then we did a couple of shows that summer and then we had, the, you know, a month or two off and then we came back. And then um, during November, December and January, all the way into the beginning of February, we had our premiere of Nutcracker. I staged my own production of Nutcracker. And it was like a nice success. We also did a, an educational show, which is Peter and the Wolf. Um, so we had just come off of those two really big successes and we were about to start another one. And then like we had even started rehearsing it and it was crazy because on Monday, we were scared that we were gonna get in lockdown. By Thursday, it was getting so bad that I only, told certain people to come in. And then I think by Saturday, we were locked in. Um, so then we had all of this momentum and then boom, stopped three months. Um, and of course, like, uh, it was actually a blessing because it gave me, we had so much momentum going into it before lockdown that it gave me and my husband time to organize actually what we wanted to do with the company and really think about it and think of a plan. And, but thankfully, you know, in Spain, just already starting back that next October or November, theaters had opened at 50% capacity and we were in there as soon as possible, you know? And also, it was also a blessing in a certain way, not for the other companies, but a lot of foreign companies could not come to Spain because of COVID. So then we had so many shows because all of these theaters had empty slots because of all these foreign companies that just could not come, you know? So we made the best of it. And that's actually, that, that's always a motto for us and me and my life in general, it's just, you have to go with it. Whatever life throws at you, you need to go with it and um, find a way through it and, uh, you know, 
try to be positive in any situation. Yes, it's it's true, <laughs> but we we know. Um, I mean, we should put some lights on on the on on the venue that you have. How 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 is your company working? Where where's your uh, headquarters? Uh, a little bit about the company, the size you've said, but the stuff you have. What's the are you an NGO or a private company? How, how do you operate? Well, uh, we are a private company uh, with me and my husband <clears throat> because, uh, yeah, we just decided to go private because we didn't want a board of directors firing us like happens in a lot of startups. You do a startup and the board of directors fires the person that uh, that founded it that's very normal in a startup company uh, we're still a startup company you know we have to make it to the five-year point before we're not a startup anymore um, we have some government support in the way that uh the we have a building with two big studios and it's specifically made for dance so then we have locker rooms and showers and it's um about a 40 minute train ride outside of barcelona and so the, the, the government has given us that. Um, we started with nine people. We, pr we did our first premiere with 13 people. And now we are 50 people. Um, 14 of them are professionals um, contracted. And the rest of them are tr professional trainees. So they come and they get a year of experience. We have 20 nationalities. We've done over 40 shows. Um, and I think we've done six productions. We've traveled to France and Andorra and the south of Spain. And we have just really ran with it. But um, part of it is, you know, we sell very well in Barcelona. And I don't think that that you know, I guess part of it is my job, but it's the dancers. Because they only have to worry about dancing, they really shine on stage with a lot of energy and authenticity. You know, they're, they're very passionate. And I think that that reads really strong with the audiences here. Uh, how, do, how dancers find you? How do they come to join the company? Do you make auditions? Do you make calls? How do you invite them? Or they come by themselves hearing about you? Well, the, the dance community is really small. <laughs> so surprisingly, I've had some of the biggest names you could ever imagine, you know, have heard about us and what we're doing and that we're doing well and we're doing the right thing. Um, so, you know, the yeah, the dance world is, world is so small, so people hear about it. Um, there's a lot of people that audition. Normally, I take people in the company through our trainee program. Um, but, you know, some, sometimes it depends. If somebody already has my style or, you know, or I just like the way they dance, they, there's a few exceptions, but normally it's from the trainee program. But the biggest, the, and the reason why I like doing that is the trainee program. I have meetings with every dancer every six weeks. I want to get to know them. Um, we talk through things. I give them feedback. Um, they can ask me questions. There's an open dialogue there. And it takes a long, it takes a while for the dancer to open up to me and therefore open up in the studio where they know they're in a safe place. They can make mistakes. Um, they can be themselves, you know, they have to work hard, of course, and do everything technically good, but, um, but it, it does take a while because normally dancers come with a lot of trauma from other places. How did you develop this structure of thinking and of work with, with people? How did you, okay, it comes from your experience, but did you did you do it intentionally or did you feel like this is something natural you want to do with your when you have your company when you are 
the one deciding how you want to have it. Uh, does it this came natural to you? Um, well, I did, I did some online college while I was in Trocadero and that was for business. So then there is this whole new way of doing business that hasn't really translated to the ballet companies yet. And that's that collaborative environment where um, I'm the leader, I'm not the director. So I try to get down on their level with them and talk to them eye to eye. I'm not a dictator. Um, I want to communicate. Communication is everything. Uh, I never had that as a dancer. I was just terrified of being fired or terrified. I just was scared my entire career. So then, <clears throat> but, but I think that is the new way to do business. You know, like you see a lot of offices, there's just one big table, everybody sits around it, you know. Um, so there's that, but also I really want all the things that I wish that I had had, I'm, we, we give to them. So for example, we have a psychologist that they can go and talk to apart from me and they can say whatever they want to that psychologist and that psychologist tells me nothing. So whatever they say there is not gonna affect their, they can rant and hate me all they want there. <laughs> you know, they get physiotherapy, they get cross training. Um, they get, you know, we, we've tried to, to, to provide everything possible for them to be their best, including open communication. And even though it takes a little bit more effort from me, emotionally, physically, it's like whatever you want. It's so worth it because the dancers don't get lost and they don't get unmotivated. They know where they stand with me. And this is actually something from Anna Wintour and Bo. If I have feedback, I'm gonna give it quick and get it over with and move on. So you know where you stand with me and that's it. Um, there were so many things, for example, when I was a dancer, because we're not allowed to talk. We're not allowed to ask questions. We're not allowed to question your decisions. So I would create all of these scenarios in my head of why certain things happen. Why didn't I get this part? I never got to ask that. Why this, why that? And I would just make up to try to resolve it in my head. And I still never know if I was right or wrong, you know? But with them, I just want them to know that, you know, I'm just straightforward with them. You know, you are kind of a leader without the title yeah. <laughs> for those who, who did a little research in this kind of management. Uh, we know exactly what what this means. But one one thing is uh, one one on one what you have with your dancers personally, as you said, you you invite uh, them to talk to you. You try to open them up uh, support and um make them ask question and questions and um analyze and you know all these things one person has to do by itself with the help <laughs> of course uh but when when you have a group of people um is it is it equally important for you also to work on this on this level when you you know, when you open up a purse and then you, 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 you let the person enter the group and then on the second level, you as a leader have to work with, with a group. How does this work? We know we are so different. Well, um, this whole like fair treatment or punishing the whole group for something that one person did. I don't believe in that. Um, I think that everybody needs very specific treatment. Um, also, there's, a, there's so many dance companies that are toxic, just extremely toxic. And especially with the ladies, but it's not their fault. It's because that there, there's normally in a ballet company, there's one favorite girl who, might be sleeping with a director. She might just have a perfect body or she might just be really pretty and nobody else exists. 
in that, right? So then the girls are clawing at each other, trying to work their way up. But then there's always this thing, well, if I don't have this type of body, then I'm never gonna get it, you know? So then there's a lot of bad energy within that that's based on a lot of these male directors that want one type of girl. They want that, blonde hair, blue eye, I don't know, right? I don't know what they want. But um, so then that, that turns the girls against each other, but it's not their own fault. I don't, my, none, of, none, none of the dancers in the company have any issues because they're all treated individually. They all need something different. Um, each dancer gets the roles that are suited for them. There's not one star of the company. Um, at one point, each person gets to be the star in whatever thing. Um, and for that reason, I have an amazing environment where it's very supportive because as long as they are dancing, their ability is what it needs to be. They're going to get the part. It's not about anything superficial. Nothing that they cannot, like I'm never going to not give some, uh, a role to somebody based on their ethnicity or their body type or anything like that. It's only about ability. And in that way, everybody can work towards something in a possible way. Everybody can move up, you know? And so in the group setting, because they all know that, and also some of them hate it because some of them do have really nice bodies and in other situations that would benefit them. But for me, I only look at ability, you know? So that is how I keep them together is I believe that, that each of, I don't believe in 100% fair treatment. They all make the same money, male, women, men, woman, whatever. So it's not about that but each person needs something different, you know? Yes. Uh, about, uh, let's talk about a little bit about artistic wise, your, you know, your orientation, choosing the productions, what you want to do. So coming from, from big companies with uh -huh. repertoire, and having this not so small company, I should say. But anyway, I, I have no idea what the size of the stage is, whether how how do you manage productions, but uh, how do you choose what you're going to do? You said nut, Nutcracker and, uh, you know, this is very typical for classical ballet. Is it is it really classical or you also try to do something else? Um, I think it's been a natural progression. I, our first program was very classical um, and very academic because we, you know, we were just starting. Then our next step was Nutcracker, which, you know, was a bigger ballet, um, still classical. Um, and then we had the quarantine and then we just repeated Nutcracker. <laughs> And, and our original uh, mixed bill. Then, you know, our next big step was um, we did the second act of Swan Lake and we did a, a contemporary piece in the same night um, to give everybody what they wanted. So the people that like classical, come and see that. If you like contemporary, they can do that too. And it's also good for them to be versatile in that way. So, um, so we are going towards, you know, being able to do everything. For, for me, the first year I didn't even dance in the company because um, I just felt really insecure and I just wanted to focus on the company. And then with pressure from the theater here, they told me that I needed to dance. So then I decided that Swan Lake would be a good thing for me to go back to I already danced it a million times in Trocadero, but I wanted to do it serious and I didn't want to do it as a female. I just wanted to be myself. So I wore 
I wear a white unitard and I wear a feather wig and I don't know what I look like. I don't know if I look like a man. I don't know if I look like a woman. I hope I just look like me. And then, but see, I can decide that. And the other cast is a female, you know, and she wears a tutu and she's gorgeous. And, you know, um, then our last summer, we did our most controversial piece. Um, there was a festival here that wanted something about gender. So then I was really scared because it's a really controversial topic and I didn't feel comfortable actually representing anyone except myself. So I made sort of it, an autobiographical piece and it ends with Swan Lake. But the first part of it is about my upbringing and what it was like for me to be different in the world. And so we are going towards more mature, you know, dramatic things, but you know, it takes years to grow a company like that, so. Of course, but um, how, how, how does the audience, uh, okay, I've seen Madrid, for instance, and some other cities, um, what is ballet there and what, what Spain has, but Barcelona is different. So you have very vivid theater scene, performing arts scene, festivals that are really famous. They are bringing things from outside, uh, outside Spain and uh, collaboration is uh, really um, well developed. How, how do you fit in now? Did, did you, are you doing like step by step and it's getting better and better or I can understand you have to position yourself. This I understand pretty well. So it's something so different. People didn't have the chance to meet. So of course, it's becoming kind of your signature. So what what is the reaction of, of the audience? You Are you having a lot of, you know, people coming to your productions and you're working on this also, are you thinking maybe, I don't know, <laughs> um, about some programs that would help to, to match audience with what you're doing? Yeah, well, I mean, the, I mean, this is part of the, the, the business mind of me, you have to study the market, you know? And so uh, during the quarantine, especially, that gave us time to really look at the market um, there was no ballet company here. They tried a million times and never worked. So, um, and you know, luckily when we started the company, we, there was no trademark for Ballet de Barcelona. So there you go. There was nothing here. So we trademarked it and we're like, okay, well that's so easy. Cause now we have an amazing name, uh, because it didn't exist. So then, but here we knew that there were two different types of theaters that really are popular here. There's musical theater and contemporary dance. And then they do have the opera here, but that's very expensive. That's only for certain types of people that can afford to go. So we knew that we needed to build an audience and it was hard, you know, our first year, you know, even though pre COVID, we were probably only selling 40% of the theater. Then, you know, each year, now we're in our third year, you know, Nutcracker was sold out every single performance this year. But because we also made it with some sort of appeal to non, for non-ballet people. So there's magic and there's, you know, there's like all of these components, the storyline is very easy to follow. We, we needed to make sure that we were educating our audiences without them knowing it. We need to make sure that it was exciting enough where even if they hated ballet or they never saw it, that it, that they, it was impressive, you know? Um, so we appealed to that, those audience, you know? So we grew that, the people that have never been to a ballet. Then with the Swan Lake and, and our tongues, which is our contemporary piece, we, you know, we totally switched up Swan Lake, you know, not only me dancing, but with the sets and everything and then the contemporary. So we were also appealing to those people of being innovators. And, you know, 
I don't think that I sell that many tickets, um, <laughs> honestly, but you know, it is something that um, is unique. You know, I'm a very unique person. I have better dancers in the company than me at this point. I've trained them better than me, but you know, uh, being that there's only one of me in the world, you know, you have to come to Barcelona to do that. And I think that they, you have to come to Barcelona to see it. And I think that that's also something that being that Barcelona is so liberal that they, you know, they appreciate. So now at this point of your life, how, how do you see uh, in a way what's, what's around in the ballet world? for you, can you, for instance, uh, give some comment, <laughs> you know, what's going on? Is there something important in the world as you can see it, mm -hmm. where people should be, should, should listen to or pay some attention to besides your company, which I believe we will come to Barcelona and see the performance soon. <laughs> what would be like important things you can see? What resonates, you know, nowadays? Well, the most, you know, like everything takes time. So then after I made history, um, I met a lot of amazing people that were like me that I just never heard of or they didn't publicize themselves or whatever. Um, but now, almost four years, three and a half years later, there are people like me that exist in ballet companies. There's somebody like me in Maurice Bejart company. There's this, there's this little guy, Leroy there, who he's amazing dancing on point and he gets roles and he's doing roles that were um, originally created for women there. I feel like I opened the door for him. There's another person at the Pacific Northwest Ballet. Um, I believe their name is Ashton. Um, that person is dancing female roles in, in their repertory. Uh, there, there's a lot more LGBTQ awareness as far as ballet companies posting things about it. Um, and I feel like maybe I wasn't the one to do what those young people are doing because they have better bodies than I do or whatever. Um, I see that, that it's changing. And, I, and I'm very, very proud that I, I took one huge step to open the door and make everybody question. Um, and, and it is changing. You know, You see more black dancers now. Um, the girls are finally encouraged to be more muscular than skinny. You know, there is a health awareness, not everywhere, but in a lot of places, it, it, it is a priority now for the, the women to be healthy and not to starve themselves. But it's very, very slow. And there are certain things that still need to be corrected and, um, and, and changed. Specifically, you know, this thing where, you know, with women, it's like, oh, as long as I'm a good girl, you know, as long as I'm a good girl, I'm gonna get a job and I'm gonna keep my job, but I just have to be a good girl and shut up and do as I'm told. You know, um, this thing is still very much present in the dance world and, um, and hopefully it'll change, you know? Yeah, but we see maybe 10, 20 years, it seems a long time, but in terms of changing the values, you know, and uh, beliefs uh, towards better <laughs> takes, takes time and 10, 20 years means just nothing. So we have to accept it. It's a part of not just our lifetime, but you know, especially classical ballet. We just had a discussion last time about these issues, uh, how you become a ballet dancer, what was the core before to become a ballet dancer, you know, measurements and, and all this stuff, like you've said yourself, 
um, blonde hair and blue blue eyes, and then I get a job. This is this is true. But for instance, I think art, and I would like to hear a little bit about this from from you as well. Art should be talking about about these issues. People who work in art uh, and are so open and can share their experience. It's important to open up the art and be and show acceptance and uh, not dividing people but bringing them together and then this is how society changes and it's so important that we feel it feel it in the end as a natural process of what we are as human what what do you think about it i mean i i think when you get down to the base of art in general it it, it is inclusive because for example like the basic traditional dances, you know what I mean? They're meant to be done together. Holding hands in circles, whatever. Um, what, it, it's supposed to have that sensation, that joy of movement, that passion. And, it, and we lose it based on so many superficial things, you know? And and with that inclusion, it, it, it needs to be about ability, you know? For example, when somebody paints a painting, it's about the artist's ability. I, most of the time, have no idea what they look like, but it's about what they produce, you know? And it's like part of Ballet de Barcelona being inclusive is no one knows who I have in the company. No one knows if I have a transgender person. No one knows if I have a black person or if I have a person that, um, whatever. All of that could happen. But the thing is to keep everyone as a group, we don't even address those issues because they don't matter at all. They don't matter. It only matters how you move and your technique and your artistry, all of those things are, are possible for people to change, you know? But to be truly inclusive, you have to, you have to really focus on, on, on the important part, you know? And, and I, I don't know, I, I, I think the opera, I don't, I don't know how that world is, I don't know how musical theater is. I know there's always politics everywhere you go, you know? But at least, at least I can make sure that the dancers that I have with me, they're, they're safe in their home here, you know? Yeah, I so wanted to hear it from you <laughs> saying that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Your family, safe, safe place, safe space where you can create what, what you feel you, you have to do. And this is what I was thinking, yes, showing the society this is possible to do without any political investigation of our souls and what, you know, questioning unnecessary things. <laughs> uh, in the end, what would be your like vision for your company, for yourself, for your people? I, I call them people <laughs> for your artists. What what would be the vision? Uh, where do you see yourself in five, in 10 years? Is there any thought like this or you are moving day by day? Um, well, when you're a director, you have to think of everything. So I need to think about today. I need to think about this week. I need to think about this month. I need to think about this year and the next 10 years. Um, th those are all things that, uh, why my head swirls all the time. I think that I, I love all the dancers that I have right now. They work so hard and they're so amazing to me. Um, every time they get better, my, my dream for them is to get paid fair. We don't have any government support. We, um, 
function on ticket sales. Uh, they deserve to be paid more. Um, I deserve to be paid more. <laughs> um, uh, I make less than some dancers in the corps de ballet. Well, imagine this, I made less than I did at ENB. I make less now than I, when I was dancing at the English National Ballet. Um, but we're working towards that. I want them to get, yeah, I want them to get paid fairly for how hard they work. I want them to have the best con conditions, you know, and we, we try to do that for them. Um, I want to keep focusing on the dancers and put, putting them first and making sure that they're valued and nourished. And I want to bring productions, uh, you know, like, I, I want to break the classics and I want to change the storylines to make them current. I did that in Nutcracker. Um, I, you know, and, and you know, like even I've tried to get different choreographers uh, to come. I'm not gonna say who, but you know, based on the body types of the girls that I have, they say no. So I'm even looking to change those people's minds about, um, about all of that. And if not, we will do our own thing because again, we are sold out and people love what we do. So yeah, I don't know. There's a million different things that I want in the future. <laughs> it's really nice. It's very optimistic and very, very firm on the ground. I believe you've said nothing that would be like high plans, not possible to achieve or just dreaming. Um, yeah, we are, we cannot jump over the, you know, the present situation and the hard times we are now and the position of artists in the world, um, you know, surrounded by political issues. What would be your message? I think it's the time for us to, to say it, to talk about this. Where where's Europe standing or what's what's going on with this world right now? It's becoming crazy. For sure you are thinking about that as well. Can you share with us a bit? Yeah. Um, and this is when I live in my little bubble. I hate war. You know, it was bad enough with the pandemic that, you know, we were trying so hard to prevent people from dying. And now people are dying over their on both sides, either defending themselves or fighting, you know, like, like, like death is such a serious thing, you know, and when we see this number pop up on, on the TV screen, 5,000 dead, 5,000 dead, you know, one dead is enough, you know, and so uh, on the bigger picture, it's just terrible, that level of destruction, that, that's people's homes. That's what they work their life for. It's being destroyed, you know, over this issue. I don't feel like I have the power to, to do anything in that way, but I'm actively doing something in my medium. So I had two girls from the national company in Ukraine message me, desperate. They fled to, to Spain. And I said, please, yes, come. Um, I, can, I can contribute that way. I can help you that way. Um, it didn't end up that they are going to Madrid instead. I also got another message today right before this interview from a, a dancer from the Marinsky, a Russian dancer that has fled Russia because he doesn't believe in, in the war. And I said, yes, you also, you can come here. You know, right now, and this is when I get all spiritual, people need love. People need hope. And anybody that stands behind love and hope and peace, I'm there for them. In the small, very maybe insignificant way that I can, if these dancers need to be home, whatever side that they're on if they're if they're advocating for love and peace i am there with them you know and i cannot be indiscriminate of that and just say oh well this person is russian 
you know, it's the same thing. I'm not going to hate somebody from um, Syria if they wanted to come, if they're, you know what I mean? Like, it, we have to transcend these political lines in art. That's what we do. We bring people together in the same theater. For that hour and a half, everybody's sitting there, you know, with energy and, and receiving it. So I must do that too. I must fight for my own people. And that and being inclusive in that way does include giving opportunity to in that way. I can contribute, I can make a difference that way. You know, I can't go and fight there. Um, but but you know, at least I I can I, I can make an impact in one or, or three people's lives, you know. Yeah, it's funny. We just m met on the phone this morning and I really, you know, you never know who, whom you meet uh, on the other side. And we didn't even discuss about bringing this question uh, in our talk, but I, I took a risk because I felt I, I should. <laughs> and I'm so grateful you, you shared with us your thoughts and uh, this is really, I believe it's brave and we all should be doing it. And it's great to know also for all our colleagues, artists to know uh, when you do something good, you are not alone. And this is the most important thing mm. mm -hmm. because some people are still afraid to, to make a move, mm -hmm. but you did. Yeah, I'm so happy you share this with us. Thank you. <laughs> But that's that's one of my biggest criticisms of the ballet world is, oh, make an Instagram post, make a Facebook post, do an interview. But what are you doing? You know what I mean? So so a lot of directors or ballet companies, they can make, oh, I support Ukraine on Instagram. They make a little story. But how? You know, I can't do a lot but I'm telling you I'm trying. I'm not, I'm not bragging about it on Instagram. I'm not screaming it. I'm not trying to, cause I don't believe that that's help. If you brag about giving somebody help then you're not helping, you're asking for attention, right? I just want these people to continue doing what they do, you know? And so whether, you know, I was gonna do it no matter what, if we had this, I was already, you know, Natasha heard me doing it before, you know, <laughs> but, you know, um, but, but really you, you know, you have to put it into action. You know, you really need to put it into action if you really want to help in whatever way, whether it be a spare bedroom, whether it be a $5 donation, whether it be just talking, I don't know, you know, even a conversation with, with, with someone, you know, is enough. Yeah, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and also this past two years have taught us that we somehow before we were thinking too, too long before moving and doing something. Now, you know, we have crisis after crisis and I, I have this crazy feeling we are just moving faster and reacting faster uh, and and yeah, being sensitive about it is so important. So yes, I, I'm, I'm really happy with what we were talking about and the ideas you have and uh, yeah, and I have this, I, I'm glad to be connected with you actually. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so maybe, maybe Natasha now, it's our usual, uh, um, usual ceremony. So Natasha maybe has a, has a, an ending question for you. You always push me in. <laughs> no, no, but I was yeah. it's becoming, it's becoming the structure. So yeah. I don't love the structure. No, so I just, I just love everything, you know, because these are so important questions uh, you were addressing. And uh, I love your ethical position in uh, in your company, especially in ballet world, 
but it's really important, you know, to talk about that and to to try to change uh, some issues that are going on for so many years. So yeah, thank you very much, really. Um, maybe I'm just a bit curious if I'm not, um, I if it's not too much, but how you said that you are a private company, but anyway, how do you, where do you find the money to make a production? You know, everything, costumes, the set design and everything, how, how you manage that? Yeah, um, it's a mystery to everyone here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I know. Uh, you know, my husband and I, we have at this point put all of our personal savings into, oh. into that, that for the first year. And um, because I studied business, I do, you know, we do everything. So I do the budgets because I worked at Disney. I, me and a lot of the dancers, we work on the costumes ourselves. Mm. Um, you know, we, we don't have amazing sets. We don't have amazing costumes. They're simple, they're pretty, they're rhinestone, they're shiny. Um, but how we make up for it is the quality of dancing. So I always feel like you can have a very empty stage um, and as long as the dancers are dancing beautifully, then everything looks beautiful. So, um, but, w w you know, I do the annual budgets and, um, and I, I make sure that whatever the company spends on a production, okay, then we need to make it back in 10 or 15 shows. So that all, that all goes with my business education and, um, and doing things economically. A lot of dance companies, they love to spend hundreds of thousands on sets and costumes. Um, yes, because they can. <laughs> they yeah. Can, yeah, they can afford it, of course. But then they're also paying the dancers very little. Mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, all the money that we can goes to the dancers, but um, but you know, the audience. You know, we also now have a sonographer, and we are growing in that way. But uh, for example, you know, a normal company might spend two hundred, three hundred thousand. You know, on on a production, we might spend thirty thousand. But we make it, we stretch it so far because we do everything. Like my my husband, he's the executive director. He also works production. I'm the artistic director but I also do the finance, the accounting. I also do costumes, you know? Um, my assistant artistic director does costumes. So in that way, it's still like, mm -hmm. but maybe that's why we're such a team though, because everybody really believes in it. Everybody mm -hmm. puts their blood, sweat and tears into it, you know? But, um, but we did get help from, from COVID, some grants from COVID. So that also helped pay for our new production last year. So. Sorry about that. Uh, I forgot to turn off <laughs> uh, notifications. Um, yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, uh, what about the, uh, the, the state? Is it possible? It, how, how does it work, you know? Do, is it possible to get some fund over the years or how, how to get some money that uh, the government would pay you? Well, um, we did get help on our last uh, production. Mm. Um, it works about like that. That's why a lot of the companies here don't have a stable company. We're the only stable ballet company here that they're contracted all year. They get paid every month. Okay. All the other dance companies here, it's by production because that's how the grants work. So you have a production and you apply for the grant and then you have that money and you pay the dancers only for that little project. And then they yeah, get yeah. The show. Um, like most of the contemporary companies, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, we're building a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. So they are slowly beginning to help. They sponsor our studio space. Um, 
and you can do that with a private you know company the but yeah but like dance here in Spain, it's always been an issue. And Nacho Duato recently has gone on to Instagram to talk about it and mm -hmm. um, that it's extremely underfunded. For example, in this region, Catalonia, yeah. the total budget for dance is 700,000 euro. But then that has to split between a lot that, that split with then everybody trying to get a piece of that. Whereas like the national company in Madrid their total budget is like more than double that. Mm, of course. You know. Yeah. I know. Mm. It's not impossible. Um, and again, we're very positive and we never talk bad about them in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, but it takes, it takes time and it takes years, but we're surviving. And honestly, it's better this way because, because we're already surviving alone. You know, there's nothing that they can take away from us. Yeah, you are more independent. Yeah, they give it to in you. In a way, you're, yeah. You're, mm. you know. Mm, that's true. That's for sure, yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I think we, uh, we opened uh, a lot of issues which are really important. And we answered some questions which are really important also. So, yeah, I'm very happy. Um, Tatiana, you want to say something else? Yes, first I want to thank you, Natasha, for, <laughs> for, <laughs> for coming in as usual. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like in a yeah. uh, puppet show, you know, <laughs> those, <laughs> those guys at the end, when they have, yeah. they have comments all, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's the funny funny side of our job. We should, <laughs> we should be happy doing it, not sad and and uh, depressed. Uh, thank you, Chase. Uh, so nice meeting you. Really, um, I'm happy we 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 had such a nice uh, discussion about many important things, which will help us for sure to find new. Uh, people around the world, new artists uh, from ballet world to, to discuss further because uh, only by this we, we can we can emphasize the importance of, of such uh, questions. Uh, yes, and for sure we will come to Barcelona when we come. We'll mm -hmm. let you know. Yes. yes. <laughs> I'll get you tickets. Okay. <laughs> no, we pay for the tickets. We pay for the tickets. Because we want dancers to be paid, you know. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we pay you printed out. You will pay yeah. you printed out. Yes. <laughs> it should be paid. We just enjoy your work. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Thank you for your openness and uh, yeah, truly. Mm -hmm. New friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. New friends. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> and thanks um, everybody watching this this was really something I should say I'm happy with everything thank you so much wish you good night days and all the best for your work yeah, all your... The best. yeah. good luck and keep on going the same way it's the, the right one thank you, <laughs> thank I'm, you. Gonna I'm just going to lead from the heart that's what I do <laughs> Everything with love and from the heart. Everyone. Okay. <laughs>